When I study Torah, I am doing two things. I am escaping the world, and by doing that, I am saving that world. And if you believe in this double move, can you imagine how, how inspired you are to study Talmud all day, every day? The Tikva Fund presents a lecture by Mika Goodman, a theology of rejection, the Haredi struggle with Zionism and modernity, was delivered in August 2016 in New York City. Dr. Goodman is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem and the CEO in Rosh Midrashah at Ein Prat. He's the author of four books. The Dream of the Kuzari was published in 2012. Moses' Last Speech was published in 2014. His award-winning book on Maimonides, Secrets of the God of the Perplexed, was published in Hebrew in 2010 and translated into English as Maimonides and the Book that Changed Judaism, Secrets of the God for the Perplexed. Dr. Goodman's most recent book is Catch 67, published in 2017. The Israeli Haredi community is a very interesting community and a vibrant community, and a community that's going today, as we're talking, through a lot of change. Now, I'm not a sociologist. I can't speak about change, but I'm speaking about the ideas that are inspiring change. Now, the Haredi society was based on a few great ideas. The idea that the entire community needs to study Torah. A second idea, the notion that, that everything they say is a represent, representation of the Torah. And finally, the project of isolating yourself from modern civilization. These three projects, isolation, very strong leadership, and the notion of, of the entire community trying to study Torah are three important ideas found in a very deep theology. And that's a theology I'm going to try to understand in this session. The story of Israel could be told in different ways. The classic way of telling the story of Israel is telling the story of the great events because Israel is a sum of its events. 48, 67, 73, Intifada, disengagement. Israel is shaped by a number of great events and if you understand those events, you can understand Israel. Another way to think about Israel is to think of Israel as a sum of its leaders. Israel was shaped by great people, by great leaders, by Moshe Dayan, by Yitzhak Rabin, by the Rav Tzvi Yehuda, by David Ben Gurion, by Menachem Begin. Israel is a sum of, it, of its leaders. It was shaped by leaders. And if you understand those leaders, if you understand these people, this is a different way of thinking of history. History is shaped by great people, by heroes. The way I want to try to think about Israel is to think about Israel through great ideas. Israel is shaped by the sum of its ideas. Now, trying to understand those ideas and to think about Israel from that point of view, from the point of view of ideas, is what I'm trying to bring to the table. And today we're going to try to do the same thing with uh, ultra orthodoxy. Now, I want to think about, about um, now it's hard to think about what is the Haredi theology, Haredi ideology just like secular philosophy, just like religious Zionism, there's many, many brands here and many, many ideas clashing. And obviously, I'll, there's many generalizations that shouldn't be made and I'm going to make. And yet, I want to try, and, and I'm going to speak about Haredi, I want to think about the founding ideas of, of Haredi Judaism in Israel. And I want to argue that it's founded on, on three very important ideas. I'd like to start with the founding idea of, orth of ultra-orthodoxy as presented by an important Israeli historian called Jacob Katz. So here's a, a way to think about history. Modernity was for Jewish communities a earthquake and a, a very powerful earthquake. It shaked everything and everything started to collapse and everyone started to panic. And what's starting to collapse is everything. Because modernity introduces a new political system. You're not a member of a Jewish political community. You're now a member of the European nation state. So it's a new political system. I'm a member of the nation state, not a member of our own particular community. New science, which challenges some of the traditional belief system. 
new values, liberalism, feminism, individualism, that challenge traditional values. New heroes. What is the character? Who is the person that the community admires? Traditional community in a traditional world, who do you admire? You admire the person that's in, that has the, the power to sacrifice his own will, to overcome himself, to swallow his ego, to surrender to something greater than himself. That's the hero of a traditional society. Who is the hero? Who do we admire in, in modernity? Not the person that surrenders himself, that sacrifices his will, but the person that embraces his will, fulfills his will, makes his dreams come true, that knows what he or she wants, that can make it happen. It's a person that fulfills himself and doesn't surrender himself. It's a different hero. We are what we admire, what we aspire to be. And in traditional societies, when you admire someone that surrenders to something greater than himself, in a modern world where you try to become the greater thing, you're all by yourself. So we have a whole lot of aspirations, motivations, new politics, new values, new belief system. So all this together is an earthquake. And can a traditional society survive modernity? Can it? It's a big question. Can it? In a very deep sense. Modern Jewish thought is an attempt to deal with this impossible challenge. The last time we had to deal with this kind of a challenge, where something happened that shaked the foundations of Judaism was in Tisha B'Av. When a society founded on a temple loses its temple, does a society lose its foundation? A society that's founded on a certain hero, certain values, certain belief systems. When all that collapses, is anything left? And as some people tell the story, modernity is so seductive. It's not only what you believe in, it's who you want to be. And people start immigrating from their communities to modernity, from Judaism to be modern, just to be modern people. Because they believe that the only way to become modern is to leave behind their Judaism. I'm telling you a story you all know. And one way to understand the reform Judaism is to stop assimilation, is to offer a, a better trade-off to young Jews in Western Europe, to say to them, you don't have to leave your Judaism in order to become a modern human being. Let's change our Judaism. Let's modernize our Judaism. So you won't have to leave your Judaism to become modern. Let's just make our Judaism modern. This is something that it's not always understood, that the reform movement was created in order to stop assimilation, to seduce people not to leave Judaism in order to become modern, but to make Judaism modern. And changes in Judaism were starting to be made in different synagogues and communities in Western Europe. And as a reaction to that, traditional rabbis panicked. This is where Yaakov Gatz comes in, his theory. They panic. And what do they say? You're changing our Judaism. You're, you can't change our Judaism. This is what kept us, you know, this is our Judaism. This is our revealed truth. So what did they declare? That change is forbidden. One of the leaders of this movement is the, is the great rabbi of Hungary called Chatam Sofer that declared that Chadash Asur Min Torah. Now obviously this is um, Jacob Katz from a critical point of view. Look at it. It says, hey, Judaism always used to change. Halacha, by the way, the book Ha'aruch, which explains Talmudic terms, understands the word Halacha itself from the word Halicha. There is movement within the law. It's halicha. There is organic change. It's moderate. It's slow. It's organic. It happens. It's not very aware of itself always. It changes. Declaring that there is no more change is change. 
אז יעקב כץ פה זה חדש, הכרזה שחדש אסור מן התורה, זה חידוש מהתורה. Now this, this irony that, that declaring freezing Judaism, declaring that there is no more change, is change creates, as Jacob Katz puts it, what we have here is we have uh, modernity. As a reaction to modernity, we have reformed Judaism. And as a reaction to reformed Judaism, we have ultra-Orthodox Judaism, which means ultra-Orthodoxy is a reaction to a reaction, which means we have two modern movements. One making an ideology out of change, that's new. Judaism used to change, there was never an ideology of change. And one making an ideology out of not changing. We have two modern movements, an ideology of change, reform movement, ideology of no more change, ultra-orthodoxy. Now I would say ultra-orthodoxy has two elements to it. One element is what I just presented. Denying change. The second element is not a reaction to reform movement, it's a reaction to what created the reform movement in their eyes, which was the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. What was the Haskalah about? It was about opening the yeshiva world, opening the Beit Midrash, being exposed to European literature and languages and ideas. He realized, wow, all this Haskalah brought us to reform movement, later on to Zionism, later on to secularism, later on to all these so, meaning Haskalah is dangerous. Opening our minds to foreign ideas is dangerous. Modernity is way too seductive. And the only way to protect ourselves from modernity is to shut ourselves down from modernity. This is the double impulse of ultra-orthodoxy. Closing Judaism and freezing Judaism. These two elements combined, creating part of the ethos of ultra-orthodoxy. Meaning there are books you can't read, there are people you can't interact with. There are thoughts you can't think. Closing down our communities, closing down our spiritual work, closing it down, guarding ourselves from modernity, and, free, and blocking change. There is, these are two moves that combined, it's the major power in ultra-orthodoxy. Now, the techniques of shutting yourselves down, closing your community, closing your curriculum, making sure that you can't really blend in, be a part of the European world. Don't Europeanize yourself. Don't call yourself Hermann or Gregorg. Stay Yechezgel. Now why is it important you're still Yechezgel? Because it's very hard to be a part of <laughs> Western society and you're carrying a name called Yechezgel. Is there any Yechezgel in this room? <laughs> <laughs> And because what people wanted to do was exactly, no, I'm a part of the German society, and you adopt and you find a different name. By the way, I chose Yechezkel because there is a very famous Hermann that his real name was Yechezkel. Hermann Cohen. Hermann Cohen. Yechezkel. <laughs> Doesn't that change everything? <laughs> the great philosopher, Yechezkel. It's very hard to fit into modern society when you carry, when you don't know the language. And if later on, I know some friends of mine that were raised in Yiddish, they spoke Yiddish till 19 in Mass Sharim because that was the way to block the influence of modernity on their hearts and minds. And now they're trying to be very Israeli. But the problem, they're carrying a Yiddish accent and it's not very easy. And finally, Malbush, this is the big one. For anyone looking at ultra orthodoxy from the outside, this is the most distinctive quality. I had an um, interaction with a Haredi in Jerusalem four years ago in the summer. It was a very hot day. It was a very hot day. He was wearing the, all the gear, everything. It was a very hot day. And I asked him, you know, it's a hot day. You could take off your, you know, let yourself loose, you know. <laughs> and he said to me, something like, in Kelksk, this is how we used to dress. So I was like, but, but it was snowing in Kelx. That's why <laughs> you used to dress that way. But for one moment, I understood something, and I admired him. I realized that the way he's dressed, 
He is a walking protest against modernity. By the way he is dressed, he is saying something. I am not from here. I'm from a different place and especially from a different time. I'm from the 17th century. When the world started going crazy, we froze there. We're from a different time, a different place. We're an alternative to modernity. But that's the thing, the cultural importance of ultra-orthodoxy. It's counter-cultural. It's a radical alternative. Now, so when you are, so this is an example. Shalem is an example of how much cultural capital you invest in making sure that you're different, you're separate, you're guarded from modernity, that you can't ever modernize yourself. Now you all know there's a lot invested in separation from modernity, in where you could learn, in where you live, and it's a lot is invested in that project of separation. I want to move into a second pillar of, of, uh, of, is of ultra-orthodoxy. It's the democratization of religious excellence. Let me explain this. In Israel, something very interesting happens. Throughout the generations, the notion that every community has a small group of an elite that doesn't work and devotes its life to studying Torah, that was very common. And the role of the community was to let that happen and enable that elite to devote their life to Torah. This is very common and very important and very Jewish. But what never happened was that instead of having a community that enables people not to work and learn, having a community that as a community, its ethos is that you don't work, you learn. What Menachem Friedman calls chevrat lomdin. This is a great, great chidush. This is tremendous innovation. That you don't enable your elite to learn. But you see the entire community as an elite that learns. Now, obviously it doesn't work. Not everybody learns. People skip. I know. I know. But the ethos that, at that we're not a community that enables religious excellence, but as a community we're going to practice religious excellence. Imagine an entire community that tries to go to the Olympics. And a community of athletes. A community. It's the democratization of religious... Because if in, within Lithuanian Judaism, religious excellence is a life devoted to the study of Torah, specifically Talmud. That's excellence. And then in Israel, from the 50s, the notion is that this excellence needs to be practiced not by the athletes of the community, but by the entire community. When I mean the entire community, I mean men. For unique people, it works. What happened in Israel, everyone became unique. It's a democratization of excellence. How does that happen? So this is a story I want to tell, and for this we have to understand something about the ethos of learning Torah, the way it was established in the Lithuanian world. I want to start with, with the Gaon Mi Vilna, the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon, as now, now I'm going to be using um, research done by an Israeli historian called Grossman. So the Gaon Mi Vilna was, in a very deep sense, he was like an um, a ascetic. And he was very influenced by a very important book promoting this way of life from the Middle Ages, from the 11th century, living by Rabbi Bachya Ibn Pakuda, a book called Chovot Alevavot. Now, Chovot Alevavot, like, like other works, which are very mystical and promote an ascetic way of life, what it tries to promote is the following. It's the assumption that emotionally we are attached to the world. We're needy people. We need people to like us. We need food. We, need, we have needs, social needs, biological needs. We have needs and passions. And these passions attach us to the world. And the whole aesthetic culture is about can we detach our, can we cancel those passions? Can we, create a can we detach ourselves from the world? Now, what would happen if you're not attached emotionally from the world? 
if you have no need to be loved, because you get along with yourself. If you have no need, oh, you're not constantly, your life is not about satisfying your needs and chasing those needs all the time. What would happen to your soul? Imagine how, many, how much energy would be unleashed. All the passion we have attached to this world, all that passion would be unleashed. All that energy would be unleashed. And that energy could be used, be focused now, on spiritual elevation. This is the thought of many, many ascetic cultures. Rabbi Nubach Ibn Pakuda says that as long as you, if you detach yourself emotionally from the world, now all this energy could elevate you and get you closer to God. The Gaon Mivilna was a part of this tradition. It was a part of detaching myself emotionally from anything that matters in this world. And unleashing all that energy so I could focus it in something greater and more important. But that something greater and more important for the Gaon Mivilna was studying Talmud. So it's a new form of an ascetic. Where you detach yourself emotionally from the world and all that new energy that you have now is to figure out the Tosfot. Is to understand in the deepest way the Talmudic discussion. So you detach from the world in order to understand and, and, and all that in, in order to excel in your Talmudic studies. That's the model. That, now the question, this model of the Gaon, is it, is it something that many people could become that hero? That's something that could be democratized? This is a form of excellence, spiritual, emotional, intellectual. That's, you know, one, it come, appears once in a millennium. It's a Gaon de Vilna. This is not something that you could offer to people. Hey, be, be the Gaon mi Vilna. There's um, a very good Israeli book about the Haredi community in Israel written by Chaim Zichirman. It's called Shachor Kachol Lavan. Anybody hear of it? Look it up. And he writes there about a conversation between a Satmer Chassid and the Rav Shach, which was one of the most important leaders maybe even founders of Haredi theology in Israel. The most important leader after the Chazonish. There was the Brisker and then there was him. He was a very important leader. And the Satmir Chassid asks the Rav Shach the following question. He asks him, see it says in the Rambam, in Mishneh Torah, Sefer Ramada, the book of Mada, Hilchot Deot, I think chapter six or five, it says the following. People have a tendency to be influenced by their surroundings. It's, it's, it's part of our natural impulse to be influenced by our surroundings. And therefore, since I am influenced by surroundings, so a smart way of living is to choose your environment, to choose your surrounding, choose your friends. Choose the friends that will bring out of yourself the better version, the person you want to be. So Rambam asks, but what happens if wherever you go, you always influ- there's, always, there's only bad people in the world. Wherever you go, there is negative environment. What do you do then? I can't change my environment. Wherever I go, it will be a negative environment. What do I do then? So what does the, Ramb- what does the Rambam say? What does this sack? Exile to where? A place of nothingness. He says, He should go and isolate himself in the desert and in the caves. If all civilization is negative, so escape civilization altogether. So in light of this halacha, the um, Satmir Chassid asked the Rav Shach, we're surrounded with negative civilization. Secularism, Zionism, liberalism, modernism, fem- you name it. Socialism. We're surrounded with these negative ideologies, materialism, all this seduction of modernity. We can't escape it. Wherever we go, it's there. Therefore, aren't we supposed to go to the desert? Aren't we supposed to go hide in caves? 
Aren't we supposed to become ascetics like in, by, like in the second temple? Aren't we supposed to escape civilization? And you know what Rav Shach told him? This became a classic answer. He told him, this is exactly what we've done. We already did. The yeshivot are our caves. The yeshivot are our deserts. I want to think about the answer of the Rav Shach. What's the purpose of yeshiva, of studying Talmud every day, all day, in light, according to this answer of the Rav Shach? This is a window into, into Haredi thinking. What's the purpose of sitting in a yeshiva, studying Talmud all day, every day? What's the purpose of that? Isolation, escaping modernity. And by the way, it's a great idea, right? Instead of running to a, to a desert, I'm studying Talmud and yeshiva all day. This is the desert. This is the isolation from modernity. By the way, this has Talmudic roots. The Gemara and Masechet Shabbat, where it describes that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted to escape the Roman Empire, before he went to a cave, where did he go? To Beit Midrash, it's a cave. It's where you hide from the world. So this I want, so this, now which leads me to the following conclusion. Are you following me? So now, the following conclusion. If for the Gaon Mi Vilna, you have to disconnect from the world in order to study Torah, today, you study Torah in order to disconnect yourself from the world. It's the reverse move of the Vilna Gaon. Did you follow that? Now, what's the difference? Disconnecting yourself emotionally from the world to study Torah is something that is only possible by unique human beings. But studying Torah in order to disconnect yourself from the world, the reverse move, who needs to do that? Who needs to disconnect himself from the world? Who is open to seduction very easily? Dafka who? The not excellent uh, Jews, right? So, you see, when studying the Talmud, it's not about religious excellence. It becomes a part of your isolation technique. It becomes a part of the culture of isolation. Then the study of Torah needs to be democratized. Then the study of Torah is for all men. Did you follow this move? So that's why what just of just um, 100 years ago, for generations, the being completely all absorbed in the study of Torah was for an elite. The minute study of Torah is a, is, a, is, a, is a cultural practice that guards me from modernity, then if that's the role of study of Torah, then anyone has to practice it. There's more to this. I want to add now another layer. One of the most important works written about the importance of studying Torah was written by Rabbi Chaim Ivlozhin. What's the book called? Nefesh Chaim. Now this book, a very important book, this is not a book which is a polemic. This is not against modernity. It's against what? It's against, it's against Hasidut. What's very, now, what's very interesting, and I'm now moving a little bit into Eastern Europe. What's very interesting that for a few years, the Hasidut was the reform movement. It was. It was a reform movement. You know why it was a reform movement? It didn't want to change, it didn't want to change Judaism. It wanted to change the hierarchy of Judaism. Because in the, in the minds of Lithuanian Jews, what is Hasidut, Hasidut doing? It's relocating what's important. Instead of in a world where study of Torah is most important, now study of Torah is not most important. And what is more important than that? Connection with God. Yeah, an intimate connection with God called Dveikut is more important. So it doesn't change Judaism, it just changed the hierarchy of Judaism. It's a change in Judaism. This is the reform movement. And the reaction to that reform movement was... What? What are you saying? 
Hitnagdut, yeah, the Hitnagdut, so that, so th that change in Judaism creates, you know, the, the, and it's just a very, very passionate. But one generation after the Golan of Vilna, so Mitnagdim started seeing themselves not as Mitnagdim, you know, okay, maybe the Hasidim are, we could marry them, we could interact with them. We can't learn from them. We probably can't learn with them, but they are, they'll be too busy doing other stuff, but they're kosher Jews. And Rabbi Chaim Ivlozhin, the great disciple of the God Nevilna, he tried to write a, um, a, to create a theology that justifies the traditional hierarchy that locates the study of Torah as the most important Jewish value. And that's Nefesh Chaim. And he uses um, a Kabbalistic idea, the revealed aspect of divinity, is these ten aspects, and there's a relationship between them. And the relationship between them influences the entire cosmos. Why? Because the whole world is a reflection of divinity. So when things change within the div divine world, so the whole world that's a reflection of the divine world changes also. Now according, they ask us to understand this and yet not to be trapped in these words. The Kabbalist asks us. Within the Sfirot, sometimes they lose their balance. And when there is no balance in the divine world, guess what else loses its balance? Our world is a reflection of the divine world. So what are we supposed to do? This is a very radical idea. Kiv yachol. Very radical idea. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to restore harmony in the divine world. Who does that? Our actions can do that. Our actions can restore harmony in the divine world. And if we restore harmony in the divine world, so, so what does that do? It injects harmony in the entire world. And that, according to some Kabbalists, is the, is the purpose of the mitzvot. The mitzvot have an impact on the divine world, and because they create harmony in the divine world, so it creates balance and harmony in the entire world. That's a reflection of the divine world. According to the Nefesh Chaim, the most important action that you can do, which is tzorich gavua, which is a divine need, kiv that restores balance in the divine world is the study of Torah. It's the study of Torah. So by studying the Torah, what are you doing? You're in a very deep sense saving the world. And I want to put this all together. And I think this is creating the ethos of Limut Torah in the Haredi world. When I study Torah, I am doing two things. I am escaping the world I'm isolating myself from the world. I'm protecting myself from the world. And by doing that, I am saving that world. It's an escape from the world and it's an act of altruism. I am protecting that world. This, this is a metaphysics that enables me with the same action to protect myself from civilization and to protect metaphysically civilization. And if you believe in this double move, can you imagine how, how inspired you are to study Talmud all day, every day? You're protecting your mind and soul and heart from the seductions of modernity, but you're not only saving yourself by doing that, because of the teurgic impact of Torah, so you're saving the world by doing that. But this is something that Israelis always can't get. The Haredim say, yeah, we, you know, we don't have to serve in the army. You know why? You know why? In light of Snefesh HaChaim theology, what, I don't have to serve in the army to protect Israel, to protect human beings. You know what I do? Saving what? Saving I'm studying Torah. <coughs> this has a magical impact on everyone. I'm so this is... A second very important piece is the whole metaphysics attached to the study of Torah. The, what, my first move was the reversal of the Gra, of the Gornivina. Now we use Torah to, 
We don't detach ourselves from the world to learn Torah, but we learn Torah to detach itself, ourselves from the world. But if you add that to Nefesh Achaim, to the notion that studying Torah saves the world, then you have the act of isolation from the world is itself an act of protecting that world. Something very interesting happened here. Nefesh Achaim was written in order, to justify Lith, in order to justify Lithuanian Judaism in front of, uh, instead of Hasidic Judaism. But what happened to the battle between Lithuanian Judaism and Hasidic Judaism? What happened to their battle? What? Yes, what, what, what really happened? Yeah, suddenly, um, Haskala, socialism, Zionut, Zionism, secularism appeared in Eastern Europe. And suddenly, Zionism, socialism, secularism, Haskalah seemed so threatening, so dangerous, so frightening, that for a Lithuanian, he looks at the Chassid, and how does he look now? Oh, he's not too bad. <laughs> so they moved from being a mitnagdim to the Chassidut to being a mitnagdim with the Chassidut. Mitnagdim to what? To all forms of modernity. And as a result, the metaphysics of Nefesh as a very dialectic result, the metaphysics of Nefesh Achaim, which was written to justify a Lithuanian way of life for Hasidut, it turned in the 20th century as a way not to protect ourselves from Hasidut, I study Torah to protect myself from secularism, Zionism, socialism, liberalism, modernity, materialism, the whole dangerous, dangerous package. We spoke about isolation. We spoke about democ democratization of religious excellence. I want to speak about leadership in the form of Da'at Torah. And finally, I want to speak about Zionism. I think the Haredi world introduces a very, very interesting and important awareness to the structure of our psyche, of our inner world. And that is, I'll use the following analogy, which is commonly used. You know, every cell in your body is something that you once ate. Right? So the process of eating is a process of turning the external world into, into you. Now, the more aware we are of this process, so it's very enlightened to be aware of what you eat. Because, hey, that's going to be me. So become more aware. I mean, some of us become more aware of how you eat, what you eat, how much you eat, what timing do you eat, not after 8 o'clock, you know, we have all this. It's a part of being, part of being very aware, very enlightened. The Haredi impulse is the following impulse. Every thought you have, every image you have, every mental activity you have going on in your psyche is something you were exposed to. It was a lecture you heard, it was a TV show you saw, it was a conversation that you had. We absorb everything, and then inside our inner world, it creates images that the sum of those images, the sum of that activity, is who we are. And if it's true, if everything we read and everything we see becomes a part of who we are, so we should think twice before we see a movie, or read a book, or go to Tikva. <laughs> we should think twice before anything we're exposed to, right? I mean, just like we're very aware of what we put into our body, should we be at least as aware to what we're injecting into our minds? Isn't, is it very enlightened to be aware of this? This is a very important Haredi move. Now, in light of this, now try to imagine a person, if you buy into the psychology, that we are the sum of everything we were exposed to, so think of a person that was never exposed to anything besides Torah. <laughs> never, never saw Seinfeld. Never. And if, and maybe that's Torah, so I'm not sure. <laughs> and what that person does is every day, all day, studies Torah. After 50 years, what happens? You be, exactly. So what happens is the following. You spill into your soul Torah. And then after, t after, 60, 70 years, what happens is that your, the Torah unites with your soul. It's not something that I know 
it becomes something that I am. And then when that happens, when I open my mouth and speak, I'm not speaking now. What's speaking through me? The Torah that's in me. That's Da'at Torah. It happened to be to one person in a generation, according to this Haredi way of thinking. That's Da'at Torah. What I'm saying is not me, it's the Torah, and therefore, you can't criticize what I just said. If I have Da'at Torah. You can't criticize what I just said, because it wasn't me that said that. Who said that? The Torah. So when you're criticizing me, you're criticizing the Torah. You can't criticize the Torah. And that gives me, me now being someone has that Torah, complete authority. You see, when a rabbi does a psak halacha, so how do you know if to obey that psak or not? A psak has always an argument attached to it, a textual argument attached to it. You could read the argument. It might convince you. It might not. If it doesn't, you could criticize the argument. But that Torah has no argument attached to it. What's the evidence that when someone has that Torah and he speaks, what's the evidence that he's right? That he said it. That he said it. That's it. That he said it. Now this is the notion that never, according to many scholars, that never existed in Judaism. That there's a person that his thoughts are beyond criticism. By the way, which world did have a person that anything he says can't be wrong? That's right, that was the Pope. But the notion, we never had a Pope. We never had a person that can't get it wrong. In, in, in Leviticus, it has the uh, list of sin offerings that different people that perform sins have to offer, and one of them is Asher Kohen Yecheta, meaning the Kohen, the priest, the person that enables people that takes people's sin offerings, he himself sometimes has to have a sin offering because he, uh, he could also sin. As a result, if you believe that someone has that Torah, so anything he says is Torah. And what he says about Tisha B'Av is Torah, about Kashrut is Torah, about which party to vote for is Torah. What you wear is Torah. If you go to the army or not, that's Torah. Let's put this all together. The three pillars I wanted to represent of Haredi theology is a notion that we're living a life that's isolated from modernity, a democratization of the study of Torah, and the notion of very, very strong leadership of people that have dat Torah. They're the gdoilim, gdoleado. These three elements together, I think, are very strong pillars of the Haredi society. Finally, Zionism. Zionism is rejected also because it's a modern ideology. A part of rejection of modernism is a rejection of Zionism. Very simple. Rav Shach was very clear about it. There's socialism, there's Zionism, it's all just one big... Oh, and the, the Haredi thinker that says the come nationalism, socialism, national socialism is the combination of what is like the epitome of the, they have all these weird. But it's not only a rejection, it's not the rejection of Zionism is not only a part of rejection of modernity. Zionism itself has a problem. We spoke about it yesterday. It was a problem of, of not accepting God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. God is controlling history. Surrendering to history is surrendering to God. Saying that we want to control history means we're not surrendering to the God's will as manifested in history. That's one theological problem with Zionism. The main theological problem with Zionism, by the way, is not the movement, it's not the idea, it's just simply the people. It's just simply the people. The fact that Zionism is led by secular Jews is a very is a very is a is a very important problem. By the way, secularism is avodah zarah; it's idol worshiping. Humanism is you, know, you worship yourself. And Rabbi El Hanan Wasserman, a very important Haredi thinker, he says, "What is religious Zionism? It's avodah zarah b'shituf." When you worship God at the same time, another God, that's called shituf. 
Religious Zionism is saying, you're religious? And Zionist, oh, okay, it's avodah zarah. Beshituf. So Zion, the rejection of Zionism is also an important piece. Now, which takes me now to a subgroup in the Haredi community, a very important group, the Eida Haredit. And that's a combination of certain Hasiduyot, which are very anti-Zionist, like Munkach and Satmel. And um, what they call Yerushalmim, people that, 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 that they see themselves as native Palestinians, the people that were here before all the Zionists came, the representatives of the Yeshuva Yashan. Have you heard of a place called Toldot Aaron, a Hasidut called Toldot Aaron, Neturei Karta? So, in some way, these are all part of a very, people say all this together is 10,000 families. I don't know with the numbers. Now, they, they do not accept all this pragmatism. They say, we don't vote for the Knesset. We don't get elected for the Knesset. We don't take money from the government. It's complete isolation. It's the Haredi theology without the pragmatism that's traditionally attached to that Haredi theology. Some of these people are very interesting people. We live in a time where, you see, I, I want to be a little bit empathetic with the panic attack from modernity. Modernity is terrifying. Its values, its belief system, its heroes, individualism is terrifying and it's threatening. How do we act to that? We're today exposed in the world to a very, to a very specific reaction. Western modernity is terrifying, it's dangerous. So how do we take care of it? We fight it and destroy it. That's the impulse of Salafiya Jihadiyya. That's the impulse of many of Islamic fundamentalism. That modernity and Western civilization is threatening, so the way to guard ourselves from that threat is to attack it and destroy it. Ultra-Orthodoxy shares the same anxiety but a completely different reaction. Instead of destroying modernity, isolating yourself from modernity. It's the opposite reaction. Instead of a very active reaction, a passive reaction. Instead of a very violent reaction, an extremely nonviolent reaction. They want to go to the army. So we live in a world where the more modernity is terrifying, the more the reactions to modernity are going to get strong. And we have two different kinds of reactions. The fundamentalist reaction of trying to destroy modernity and its values and its political systems. And that's a way to get rid of the threat. Or to protect, just let it happen and you become passive. You, you try to become indifferent to it. You just guard yourself from it. So it's the, it's the panic for modernity taken to a different place. When I presented the synthesis of secularism, Zionism, and socialism, I argued that, in the end, the collapse of socialism led to a crisis in secularism and Zionism. The synthesis between religion and Zionism and the glue was, mess was a messianic glue. When the messianic process didn't, think, didn't seem like it's, it's fulfilling itself, religious it Zionism inter is entering a very interesting crisis. But I think the crisis of secular Israel and the crisis of religious Zionist Israel is not even close to the real crisis, the crisis that's facing Haredi Israel. It's not a crisis of an idea, it's a crisis that happens when an idea clashes in face of reality. This crisis has three pieces. The first piece, and a very important piece, is internet. If your entire cultural project is to protect yourselves from the world, protect yourself, isolate yourself from the world, not be exposed to the world, so we live in different lane, and we, we, we dress differently, and we live in different neighborhoods, and we have, and, and we study Torah, so we can't be exposed to it. If there's so much cultural capital invested in isolation, then internet comes into the world. And what does internet do? Oh, you can't go to university, so you won't be exposed to biblical criticism. 
Because if internet, you'll be exposed to biblical criticism in your room. You, you won't be um, a part of, you won't be a part of, you will, of, um, of um, the public space. You won't be exposed to the dominant culture and heroes. Well, you'll have it in your pocket. The whole project of isolation collapses unless, so the great rabbis went to war against the internet. And they said that internet is the most impure, like if you walk in mass, it's a vodah zara. And, but in Israel, were they successful in fighting internet? Between, now the numbers are between 40 and 70 percent have internet, and as a Haredi friend told me, and 30 percent are lying. Now he said, now when anybody has, so the whole, so technology made the entire isolation process collapse just overnight almost. And it's terrifying. Now, they say, now what happened to the leadership? To the notion of leadership? Listen, the idea of Da Torah is an amazing idea. That one person has Da Torah, and everything he says is the Torah saying, so, we, so we're all obedient, which takes a community which has so many shades and brands and unites them because of very strong leadership. But what happened to Da Torah, to Gdole Ador, what happened to them? They died. In 2012, Harav Yoshif died. And who replaced him? Well, here's the thing. See, when, think that Torah has an interesting logic. How do, you know that, how do you know that somebody has that magic? Has that Torah? How do you know? Well, here's how you know. If everyone thinks he has that Torah, he probably has that Torah. <laughs> I'm serious. By the way, can you imagine the miracle that all the Jews agree that somebody has on something? That probably means he actually has that thing. So, so by the way, this is cyclical, obviously. Everyone believes in it because everyone believes in it. But the thing is, in 2012, uh, Rav uh, uh, died, and uh, his replacement, who's his replacement? Well, in Bnei Barak, his replacement is Rav Steinman. And in Jerusalem, his replacement is Rav Oyerbach. And everybody says, they are the ones who enjoy consensus. Now, you're going to stand the paradox here. If there is a testimony that no one has consensus, is that when there's a disagreement on the question, who has consensus? Who enjoys consensus? Now, anyone that has a newspaper, by the way, and they use their newspaper, Yated Ne'eman and Apeles, and they use their newspaper to glorify their Gdolado, and let's put it this way, sometimes they, they do it not by glorifying their Gadol, but by attacking the other Gadol. And I'll just be very polite, um, sometimes, uh, I'll be subtle. Sometimes the way they do it is, um, Let's put it this way, they're not very polite sometimes. <laughs> the way they attack the other Gadol. And who's, by the way, the victim of a mud fight between the two Gdolin? Who's the victim? Everyone. The institution of the Gadol. And by the way, these two people all searching for the career of, of Gdol Adol to lead the generation, to lead the world of Torah. These two young people, the guy in Bnei Brak is 102 years old. And the guy in Jerusalem was very young. He's like, I think, 90 or 91. <laughs> so you understand that the battle of titans between who's going to lead, who's going to be the career of the Gdol Adol. So one is 100, which means that when they die, how many people are going to try to replace them? We're in the process. It's called, it's the notion of the privatization of Gdol Adol means the end of Gdol Adol. By the way, for this Faradi community, it already happened. How many replacements do we have? to the greatness of the Rav of Vadya Yosef. How many? Do you know their names, by the way? I'm sure you don't know all their names. You don't? Yeah. Also, there's like four, five people saying they're the real new Rav of Vadya. By the way, they're all also pretty old. This is all. We are facing the privatization of Dodo. I want to put this together. So if Charediyut was three pillars, isolation, strong leadership, and democratization of Limut Torah, leadership is collapsing. Isolation, the model, is collapsing. And we're left with the kehila lomedet, as if no one, we don't go to the workforce. We, but there's a problem. Economically, that model is collapsing. It's not working anymore. And more and more Haredi want to join the workforce. More and more mainstream Israelis don't want to finance that way of life. 
And by the way, these processes are feeding each other because when Haredim are seeing an alternative way of life in the internet, they want that way of life, they want to go work. And when they want to go work, they're exposed. So to more, to, and more and more to technology and to internet, these things feed each other. Now let's put this all together. Haredi, the pillars of Haredi Israelism are collapsing. And this just happened. The past decade, it's happening as we're talking. And you see, when the economic model of Chevra Lomedet collapses, when the isolation model, because of internet, doesn't seem to work, a society needs to change. For it to change, it needs leadership. And that's the moment where it lost its leadership. You see, this is a crisis. This is a, this is a serious crisis. There were some great ideas created in the 19th century and implemented in the 20th century. Secular socialism was one of them. Religious Zionism was one of them. And also, the radical Haredi ideas, those were also important ideas created in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, implemented in Israel throughout the 20th century. And these ideas, all three of them, are important ideas, inspiring ideas, but all three of them, when they meet reality, they started to collapse. And these three sessions were about those ideas in theory and those ideas in reality.